Look, I'm just trying to tell you because I am who I am and I've been where I've been that you don't get another chance at what you have. I have it all. Mad Men is as close as it gets to being the ideal character examination, a flowing work of art that uses its time period, primarily the 60s, to reflect the dynamic state of then-contemporary culture to shine a light on the multifaceted cast and the main ideas being examined in this crucial decade. And it does this with a calculated yet skillfully effortless approach that lends a great element of lyricism to the show. With so many lines of dialogue from the characters having dual meanings, so many character arcs mirroring the state of America at that time. But while Mad Men remains poetically cohesive, being truly consistent and masterful across the span of its seven seasons, for me the peak of the story has always been its fifth season. It's just where all of the most compelling characters were given emotional payoff and introspection, where the story reached some of its darkest and arguably most dramatic beats. And it does this through a few key methods. Season 5 of the show represented a little bit of a style shift in terms of narrative presentation and writing. Season 4 contained the biggest change for the now-named company of Sterling Cooper Draper Price, having them start fresh as a new agency. And although it began months after the opening of the new firm, many of the characters were still sort of stumbling around and finding their place during the fourth season. But in Season 5, things are different and more settled, with a lot of the characters having found themselves on stable ground. And this allows the story to focus in on them in a more deliberate, stable way, to look in on where their lives are and how they feel about their place in the world around them. Whereas the show has basically always done this, and has never not been a character piece first and foremost, in my opinion, this season took this to an extreme to place an even higher focus on internal psychology within the cast. The primary two characters of the series, Don Draper and Peggy Olsen, had already been explored to a great degree, but season 5 places more importance on the characters that, while very contributory and significant, were just a tad on the periphery. The likes of Joan Holloway, Roger Sterling, Lane Price, and most significantly for the topic of this video, Peter Campbell. This change of approach worked to stunning effect, allowing so many rich little stories to be told throughout the episodes, and as such, allowing this season to work as an encapsulation of Mad Men's greatest strengths. And to specify even further, I believe that there is one episode that is a microcosm of why I love this show, being a beautifully directed, painfully written, self-contained story that also progresses things and lends deep insight into the views of one of the tortured souls of the story. Episode 5 of Season 5 of Mad Men is entitled Signal 30, and though it is close, this is my favorite episode of the show. It primarily follows the story of Pete, and makes him the, somewhat ironic, star of the show for once. And while the episode did progress some other plot threads, and reveal things about some other characters, there is a clear purpose to this that far outshines the rest. Let's discuss how this episode is a 48 minute portrait of Pete Campbell the man at this point in the story. Throughout the show, Pete is constantly thirsting to prove himself and feel appreciated and special, because that isn't something that is granted to him easily. Instead of recognizing his merits and forming a connection with him, in his eyes, others belittle him and dismiss him as privileged due to the benefits he gets as the son of a prestigious family. So he festers a burning desire to prove himself, in order to ultimately find value and get the admiration and relationships he seeks. And the sad thing is that in progress towards that goal, he becomes the exact type of person that would repel the type of attention he so craves because of how directionless and obsessed he is with reaching that foreign place of joy. And when he does reach places in life where he thought that happiness would suddenly spring up, he's met with the terrible reality that he just can't find what he's looking for. He's the furthest thing away from peace at this point in the story, and though the events here are relatively mundane, it's one of the most disturbing episodes of television I've ever watched, due to how slowly it takes the man apart and shows how lost he really is. 
The episode begins with Pete in driving school, watching a film on accidents and unsafe driving. He notices a very young woman in his class and strikes up a rapport with her, attempting to impress her and eventually to seduce her, which immediately indicates that he's at the very least not totally satisfied with his family life. We then cut to him in bed at night, visibly on edge and restless, as he can't find himself able to relax due to the loud dripping of his leaky faucet. This isn't a novel interpretation, I'm sure, but I see this drip as representative of Pete's anxiety and desperation, that nag in the back of his mind telling him that he isn't happy. And it's no coincidence that he can only hear it when he's at home, the one place where he's supposed to be fulfilled. He can't sleep, can't relax, and cannot bring himself to be at peace with his life due to this growing unhappiness. And notably, his wife Trudy tunes it out, totally unbothered, joyful and satisfied with her life, deaf to this nagging feeling that takes over Pete and leaves him feeling shallow. Does it go like that all day? I suppose, but I don't hear it. He seemingly fixes the leak, thinking that he solved the problem. But if we jump ahead for a quick second, we're reminded that it was never actually fixed at all. It was a coincidence, and the problem was still there. It's symbolic of the fact that Pete constantly strives to be in another place and initially feels like he solved his unhappiness, only to be reminded eventually that the pain and yearning, that leak, that dripping, never really went anywhere. At work, there's a meeting with the partners where Lane says that he's befriended Edwin Baker, Senior Vice President of Public Relations for Jaguar Cars, which basically means that they have a chance of landing their first car. This is a great opportunity for the company, but Pete pours cold water on it, saying that this new business would likely require hiring a bunch of new staff, causing financial constraints that would not be feasible. The rest rebuff his hesitancy, saying that if he had brought this in, he'd be saying differently. This speaks of Pete's insecurities, of his desire to stand out and impress, to make himself feel taller and more important by pushing others down. Lane says that he'll take responsibility for trying to wrap a bow on the agreement, to which the others are apprehensive. After the meeting, Pete gives Don directions to his house for a small party being hosted by him and Trudy at his home. Don tries to get out of it, but Pete is confident that his wife would only have acted on a certainty that him and his wife Megan were available. Don does try to worm out of it by calling Trudy, but she's prepared for every eventuality. It's too bad your husband can't close a deal like this. We both know he's doing just fine. It's a charming little scene for Trudy, but it also just reminds us how valuable Pete is to the company, even though that much is blindingly obvious by this point in the series. But as we see in conversations with the girl he consistently tries to pursue, this success doesn't make him feel comfortable or accomplished. Things seem so random all of a sudden. And time feels like it's speeding up. It does. Doesn't it? Pete has garnered praise and become significant. He's achieved many of his own personal goals, and he's proven his worth. But he still somehow doesn't feel as if he has a grasp of his own life. He doesn't have control, and he feels like he's being taken for a ride. The episode smoothly moves into the dinner party, where we're immediately introduced to the grandness of Pete's living abodes through the eyes of others. The great house, the fantastic record player, the beautiful wife, all of this out in the luxurious suburbs. From an outsider's perspective, Pete has a great deal to be happy about. Yet, when the Drapers arrive, he nervously makes it clear to Don that it's a huge deal that he's there. And this makes it clear to the audience that he still wants to prop himself up and force his way into being appreciated by others. Years and years on from his days of naivete and desperately trying to impress others in season one, and this aspect of him remains unchanged. Look, I'm not going to pretend it's not a big deal to us that you came out. Oh, come on. We're long overdue. 
The dynamics of this party are really quite a fascinating look into the psychology of all of these characters, where they are in their lives, and how the office politics dictate how things play out. It's clear to all that Don is the man. Everyone looks to please him and laugh at his jokes, and he speaks with an effortless amount of authority and charisma, even in this more casual setting, with everyone entranced by every word he speaks. Pete has become secondary in his own home, and it's probably not clear to him initially due to how organically he regresses into that role, due to how naturally that comes to him and how often it happens. But again, it's not something he is consciously proud or satisfied with, and it's not how he likes to live. He wants to feel more significant, he wants others to look towards him with admiration and appreciation. And despite his important job, his new status, his great life, he doesn't have that which he longs for, and I can't imagine how frustrating that must be. The conversation then moves to co-worker Ken Cosgrove, someone Pete is above in the pecking order, yet has always considered competition. Ken has slowly been making some progress as a writer, as his wife excitedly shares. He's been able to turn this passion of his into something that's a genuinely big part of his life, and it's an exciting thing to share. This draws attention at the party to him. People are interested in his stories, both here and out in the world, and he begins to turn heads too. Ken's wife explains one of his stories, a narrative that fittingly chronicles the tale of a robot that feels powerless in the world he inhabits, not unlike our dear Pete. And in the process, we see that people are interested in Ken. And Pete doesn't like this and watches with a dismissive demeanor. He's uncomfortable with Ken being seemingly reluctant to share his passion, yet undeniably happy and at peace with his hobby. He doesn't like that others are supporting Ken and finding him impressive. As a result, he tries to downplay the deep existential meaning of Ken's story, but others keep drawing attention back to it. Why is he doing? Because he's a robot. Those people tell him what to do, and he doesn't have the power to make any decisions, except he can decide whether that bolt's on or off. Or he just hates commuters. <laughs> <laughs> How long have you been writing? I started screwing around in high school, and by the time I got a job, I thought it would go away, and it mostly has. It's a very short sequence of lines, but it feels like an eternity for Pete. And so now, he feels like he's the least important man in the room, and that is something that doesn't sit well with him. And by my reckoning, this has risen to his consciousness by now, where it hadn't quite gotten there when it was only Don who was being admired. As the host, it's arguably on him to allow his guests to shine and feel important, but he doesn't adhere to this. His pride and ego dictate that it doesn't sit well with him. And a lot of this is communicated by subtext and beautiful subtle acting through facial expressions. He can gloat about his music, but he gets sour when Ken's life seems interesting. It's bizarre. No one is measuring the impressiveness of anyone else, and no one is counting except him. Because therein lies his loneliness. He has achieved, but his achievements are not as noteworthy or sexy as being a writer or being Don Draper. They don't grant him what he seeks. He stands unimpressive, surrounded by that which he should be happy with, yet isn't. He feels as if everyone else is finding the happiness that he can't grasp himself, and it drives him crazy. I may be looking into this a bit much, given how small this scene is, but considering the type of man that Mad Men has consistently communicated that Pete Campbell is, I don't think so. I think this is genuinely where his mind is at in this tiny moment, and the acting, behavior, and mannerisms drive it home. Towards the end of the party, the women find that the faucet that Pete had apparently fixed is still a problem, as it explodes and showers down on all of them. While Pete makes for the toolbox, Don is able to fix things in a blink of an eye, and it again reinforces the idea that Don is the man, that he is more than him. Pete is a pretender. He can't do these things, and it doesn't come naturally to him. This power, this air of confidence. So he fakes and forces his way through life, and finds that these methods do nothing for him. 
He looks on with admiration and mingled bitterness, stewing in his lack of control. But I think that the most painful thing for him is the image after this of him and his beautiful wife and daughter, the perfect picture of an American family, or so it seems to the onlookers. But in actuality, it's a shallow and hollow front, an artificial mask of happiness. Back at work, Lane mentions that he hasn't been able to close the deal with Jaguar, so Pete, Roger, and Don agree to take the client out and have some fun with him for Lane to ultimately close the deal. Lane agrees, somewhat reluctantly but open to admitting to his own limitation here. And as we transition back to driving school, we see that after gradually trying to progress with the girl, a new boy joins the class and quote unquote steals her from Pete as she's immediately smitten with his advances. The moment she begins talking to the newcomer, it's visibly obvious that Pete knows his chance has slipped away. He loses, powerless once again, and it makes him feel pathetic. We then cut to the fated dinner with Edwin Baker of Jaguar, where he confirms that he intends to give them his business, but just wants to have some fun for the night. Ever the man for the job, Roger takes them to a party of sorts, to what is basically a dressed up whorehouse. After a very significant look from Don, a mix of disinterest and a slight disappointment, and a look in return of resigned frustration yet acceptance, as if he knew that he was doing something wrong, Pete makes off with one of the women here, and she tries her best to find out what his kink is. She begins first with the eager to please housewife routine, which Pete had no interest in as I'm sure it was at least somewhat reminiscent of Trudy. She then plays the bashful virgin, which doesn't do much for him either. And then, third time's the charm. You're my king. Okay. Pete just wants to be in control, appreciated, admired. All the things that he feels that he doesn't have right now. His current life doesn't fulfill him, and he knows that it should. But this scene keys us in to exactly what he desires. In the car ride home, Pete expresses frustration at Don for his lack of participation in the festivities with the women, likely due to his own bitter feelings of regret. Don is satisfied and disinterested in cheating on his wife at this point in his life, and Pete, as always, admires, resents, and envies his partner for everything that he is. Boy, this is rich. I can't believe I have to explain I was doing my job to a man who just pulled his pants up on the world. I suppose there are no stern looks for Roger. Roger is miserable. I didn't think you were. Don tells him that he's taking things for granted, which eats at him because he knows he is, yet doesn't feel like he is, and it's a situation that plagues him. Why isn't he happy? It's torturous. And I have a bunch of human sympathy for Pete in this moment, as flawed a man as he is, because being told that you have everything when you feel as if you have nothing must be awful beyond words. The next day, Lane blows up on the partners because Baker's wife found out about the previous night and he got in trouble. They find it humorous, and Lane is understandably very upset. But things get serious when Pete makes a jive at Lane's naivete and poor closing skills. Something that once again is said in service of his ego in my opinion, downplaying Lane's importance to the company to make himself feel bigger. As a result, Lane challenges Pete to a fight. What's so important to note here is the shock and desperation on Pete's face. When challenged, Pete looks at his partners as if begging for some sense of support and camaraderie or some sort of defense for him, and he finds nothing. Not to blame them, of course. It's an awkward situation and Pete is far from innocent. But it's a sad moment for a man whose feelings of loneliness and weakness are backed up when those who he thought might have been his friends don't move a muscle to help him. And of course, he loses the fight. He can't back up his words with action, and he lays defeated, appropriate for his mindset in this episode as he constantly dwells on his unavoidable misery. When offered help, he says that he's fine to downplay his weakness, 
again. But before he leaves, he looks at his partners with a deep hurt as a result of them not supporting him when it mattered. He yearns for connection from people that can't provide him with it for one reason or another, and it destroys him, especially since a great deal of that is his fault. What was I supposed to do? Step in? Punch Lane? Why are we even having a fight at work? This is an office. We're supposed to be friends. Again, he is in no way, shape, or form a blameless victim in this situation, but that doesn't mean that he isn't sympathetic once you put into perspective just how and why he is the way he is, and where this path has taken him, especially in comparison to how he wants to be. Everyone in this office has wanted to do that to Pete Campbell. Afterwards, Pete wallows in misery and eventually leaves the office. He pours himself out to Don, and he returns to a classroom that only now reminds him of his shame, to a home that doesn't feel like home, a wife he doesn't truly love, and to a ceaseless dripping, a man powerless to even fix his own sink. Overlaying this montage is Ken's stab at a story of a man living in the country possessed of an unbearable loneliness, who looks on at the ordinary lives of others with an unbelievable envy and sadness, clearly reflecting the trials of Pete in this moment as he is constantly faced with the silent, painful quiet of the life he chose and now realized he wants no part of with the beautiful bookend of the dripping tap, ending the episode in the same way it started it, with Pete in driving school, haunted by the sound of his own pangs of bitterness. It's an episode that puts everything Pete Campbell is at the forefront. His flaws, his insecurities, his unhappiness and pettiness and pride, and most of all, his need for others to help enrich his life. For the vast majority of the series, Pete is always desperate to be somewhere other than where he is right now. In the beginning of the series, he seeks to be like Dawn, to have a beautiful wife, to have women on the side, a job of status and power, to have influence, and most importantly, to be respected for his true worth, to strive past the label of the privileged guy given everything by his family. And yet, when he gets what he seeks, he finds it isn't nearly as satisfying as he thought it would be. The grass is always greener somewhere else for him, and his journey is a maddening search for that somewhere else, for that sense of true purpose and peace. And what it truly revolves around is a desire to feel worth through getting respect and affection and connection with others, all of which he feels like he deserves. But many things about him, his flaws, his time period, his co-workers, don't allow him to do so. He doesn't feel appreciated by Trudy despite her love for him, he's shown up by those more handsome and interesting than him, and he can't seem to avoid this nagging sadness that slowly but consistently eats away at him. He's lost, in no ways that matter professionally, but in all the ways that truly mean something in actuality. He can't find the joy in life that he pursued up until this point, while everyone around him seems to have no trouble in being passionate about things. He just wants to feel like he's living a life of purpose of his own. Pete eventually does find his happiness, but this episode is a brilliant capstone and picture of his true sense of isolation and emotional wanderlust at this point in the story, his desperation and agony. Here, he's a broken man trying to feel whole, and this episode is an understated yet overwhelmingly impactful character piece that compounds the depth of Pete through such brilliant use of subtle characterization, visual storytelling, and clever direction. He has everything, from the outside. But that doesn't bring him fulfillment, just as it never brought it to Dawn when Pete looked through his rose-tinted glasses at his life earlier on. None of it matters to him, and despite these things, he doesn't feel in control. What does he want? What is he searching for? Is there anything that he genuinely desires? 
As the era of the story moves into a period of true change and scary progress, Pete feels taken on a ride that is his life, cursed to constantly follow his instincts about what he believes will make him happy, only to never find it. He's such an incredibly human character that displays the painful existential uncertainty of this period of time, and Signal 30 is a brilliant summation of this resonant concept. Many thanks for watching. I have nothing done.